Hi. Um, so, who here gave, saw me give a similar talk at, at Biddle 2.0? What's one person I'm going to board? Two. Okay. Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me try and. Uh... Right. So, I want to talk about um, consensus protocols and, and their properties. I'm not going to talk too much about parachains and what actually makes Polkadot interesting. Um, so I'm going to try and sort of consider this from the perspective of, of a single chain. And sort of the question is, what do we want from consensus? Um, other question, other thing I have here, finality. Uh, this ties into what we were just discussing. Uh, when is a block never going to be reverted? Um, so, who here understands how, how Bitcoin works, how proof of work uh, gets consensus? Hi, yeah, it's okay. So, who here understands how proof of work gets consensus? I'm sure you've, yeah, all kind of read how this works. So, um, we have a limited block production rate. To, so to produce a block, we have to solve some, uh, some problem. And everyone, and the person who, who solved this problem gets to produce a block, and they should put it, they should put it on the end of the longest chain. Uh, there always will be forks, but the point is, is that if we have uh, the longest chain, should keep getting longer, and this will give us eventual consensus. So why is that the case? Well, um, so why, why would we have a fork? Well, um, so we could have a fork of, of length one. Maybe these two, these two blocks were produced at about the same time, and, and this guy didn't see this, this block. Or maybe this guy is out of sync with the rest of the network. Or maybe, actually, he's malicious and he's trying to double spend. But the point is, is that the probability that the next block is going to be produced by such a, uh, a miner is not very high. And to produce uh, longer forks, this has to happen uh, again. And what this means is that we probably don't have very long forks. And so then that means that blocks that are uh, further back are probably always going to be in the longest chain. So this, this also relies on the, the network working properly so everyone sees the longest chain. So what sort of uh, properties does this give you? Well, we have eventual consensus. We have probabilistic finality. Uh, we can see how far back a block is and judge what is the probability that it's final. Of course, the downside of that is uh, remember having to wait an hour for six confirmations for Bitcoin. Um, so if we want to be really certain that something is final, we have to wait a while. When, in fact, one or two blocks is probably enough. But the advantage of this kind of system is it's decentralized. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, there's, there can be many block producers, so potentially, I suppose, because uh, it's not always the case. And, um, it's robust to uh, parts of the network going offline. And I call this a starfish property. So if you have a starfish and you cut off its arm, it will grow back. And some species of starfish are even, even, have an even stronger property, which if you cut, cut them in half, both sides will grow into a starfish. And this, this, is, this is what will happen. If you have a, uh, a network like Bitcoin, if we have a network partition where two groups of people are not talking to each other, both of them will, will carry on producing blocks. I will end up with two chains. Now, but dealing with lots of nodes going offline is, is a, a useful property. So I think Ethereum uh, 2.0, one of their design goals was to uh, survive World War III. Uh, yeah, we'd like Polkadot to do that too. Now, I call this proof of work light consensus because um, Many proof-of-stake systems have similar properties, like Next, which sort of 
uh, tried to emulate Bitcoin and many things that work in a similar way, but also some wild and wonderful consensus algorithms um, work like this. But there's sort of another class of consensus algorithms that don't have this property, so have something um, very different, which um, sort of started from this, this uh, classical computer science metaphor, the, uh, the Byzantine generals problem. So these are so-called Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus algorithms. So the Byzantine generals problem, it's sort of, uh, we have a bunch of armies surrounding a city, and they're trying to coordinate so that they all attack at the same time, because if only a few of them attack, they'll be defeated. And the problem is, is that messages are slow. They don't have radio. Uh, we don't want too many messages. The other problem is that some of these, uh, some of the generals in charge of the armies are, don't follow the protocol. Um, and so, so, and the sort of metaphor is we want a, a protocol which um, can deal with nodes um, being offline, being out of sync, or actively trying to attack the system. As long as the proportion of uh, such nodes is small enough, uh, it's still going to work. And so, um, on the blockchain, uh, there are many consensus algorithms that, that work by Byzantine agreements on a, on a single block. So you try and get agreement on the next block. Um, and once you've agreed on it, you build another block. Uh, so sort of uh, Tendermint works like this. And I won't be able to explain exactly how these work uh, because I don't have time. But sort of uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, we have lots of two votes that need two-thirds of people to uh, agree on one thing to pass. And uh, so why, why do we have these, these two-thirds votes? Well, uh, so how does this give us tolerance? So the reason we can tolerate a third of people going offline with these two-thirds votes is basically, well, so the first thing is, why don't we just go for a majority? The problem is, is that um, these guys who are behaving arbitrarily what they can do is they can tell different people that they've, they're voting for different blocks. And um, if they do that, someone can see a majority for some block and someone can see a majority for a different block if the, everyone else is split. But if there's only a third of people and being bad, then we can't have two thirds on two different blocks because if we see two thirds, it means a majority of the honest guys were voting for that block. But on the other hand, what's probably more likely these, uh, the, bad pe the, the, the people aren't following the protocol are going to do, they're more likely to not vote at all. And now, if a third of people don't vote, then the two-thirds of people who do are enough to make it work. And this is uh, why we have these two-thirds voting. And uh, so, so what, what, what properties does this give our consensus algorithm? So we have fast finality, so now instead of waiting for an hour, we might be waiting seconds uh, to finalize a block. We have asynchronous safety. However bad our network is, we never, as long as um, our assumptions hold, we never finalize different blocks. And uh, the thing that's important for the bridges we were talking about earlier, provable finality. Something's final, we have a statement signed by two thirds of people saying it's final. And this means we can convince like clients and we can convince potentially other chains that this is final. And convincing other chains is important to us because we care about interoperability. So, uh, for instance, uh, Cosmos uses this, this Byzantine agreement on every block, this tendermint, to allow uh, different chains to talk to each other. In Polkadot, we don't really need that. And one of the reasons we don't need it so fast because we have shared consensus, power chains can talk to each other um, relatively easily, but if you want to talk to the outside world, having provable finality is important. But sort of the, the downside of uh, 
Byzantine agreement algorithms is that um, everyone has to, these rounds of voting, everyone sends a message to everyone else, and this is either, if there's a lot of people, this is slow. So either you're centralized or you're slow. And so, so the question is, can we get most of these things um, in one algorithm? Well, you, you sort of can if you're a bit, uh, if you're a bit more modular. Some of these we can't get at the same time. Uh, but we can get most things. And the way to do that is to do the thing that Ethereum are thinking of doing, um, which is we have, um, we separate block production from finality. We keep our block production uh, decentralized, um, and then we run a finality gadget, a, a Byzantine agreement protocol on top to decide when things are final. And that will give us uh, our, so we get probabilistic finality in the short run, and that late, later we'll, we'll turn that into provable finality. And this can be more decentralized, we can have more guys, but that means we're slower. But being slower in finality will not slow down block production. It also means that uh, we can manage to be safe. But if lots of people go offline, then we, we keep on going. We just don't finalize anything. So we can survive World War III. Uh, so what's a finality gadget? So basically, the idea is let's agree on what we've already agreed on. Uh, but make it provable this time. So everyone sort of votes on what they see as the best block, maybe what they see as the longest chain, uh, including anything that we've finalized. Uh, so Ethereum um, are thinking of using this. They came up with Casper FFG. This is the uh, classical finality gadget. That, um, and it sort of works by agreeing on checkpoints. Sort of every 64 blocks, we have a vote. Um, on blocks with a certain blo a block number that's a multiple of 64. And if uh, we have uh, two of these votes passing in a row for the same chain, then we finalize those 64 blocks and any blocks before that that weren't finalized. So um, here in Polkadot, we didn't like um, this waiting for 64 blocks thing. We don't know exactly how many blocks it would take to get to agreement. And so uh, I decided to come up with a different finality gadget, um, which could agree on you know, as many blocks as we could, we've already agreed on. And I also wanted to sort of formalize the problem. So we came up with this algorithm called Grandpa, pretending for this crazy thing. And uh, sort of want to outline very quickly how it works. So, so imagine we have, we have we're, we're voting for sort of the, uh, the head of the best chain that we see. Now, of course, this is often be a situation where people don't agree what the last block in the, in the chain is, but we kind of have a majority for this chain. Uh, so how do we get around that? We certainly can't wait for two thirds votes on a single block because that might never happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, use an idea from the, the other Casper, uh, like Brad Zamfir's Casper T, uh, TFG, um, which is this idea of using the, uh, the ghost rule on votes. So what we do is we sort of count each vote for, uh, a vote for a block and a vote for every block before it. So if we sum these up, we end up with something like this. Uh, this is 30 and 40, and up to 70% for these things here, and so forth. And then we follow the chain uh, which has the most votes. So we, we have a choice here between 70%, 40%, we follow the 70%. And uh, and sort of the idea behind Grandpa is we take this, um, this ghost on votes rule and we sort of insert it back into a, a more traditional Byzantine agreement. And the way we do that is we, uh, we, look at, we follow it until we have two-thirds of votes. And just as if we have a two-thirds vote on something, we sort of, we're guaranteed uniqueness if we see two-thirds of one thing. Um, we're not going to see two-thirds for something else. 
only maybe something for nothing. Here, if we see a chain, whatever chain people see is going to be unique. You might see different lengths of it, but we end up with a unique chain. And so then what we do is we just sort of uh, put that into our rounds of voting and Byzantine agreement algorithm, and it kind of gives us the, that we agree on whatever prefix two-thirds of people already agree on, um, which is this aim of a checkpoint-free finality gadget. Um, and that's it. 